We're going to go through a lot of topics today, and in many senses, what I will talk to you about is what I personally find the least interesting and most boring of all of these topics, which is to say, I'm going to be talking to you about kind of the planning phase and how the information feeds into the action. And as I think you'll hear in the course of today, if that action is not effective and carefully thought out and well conceived, then everything that I'll talk to you about in the next 20 minutes or so is immaterial. It's really just an exercise in data analysis, but it, it can really come to nothing if, uh, if all of the succeeding steps don't work as well. But I do want to give you just a very quick view into steps that come before actually implementing conservation in a place. So let's, let's just think a bit. This is, this is kind of my thinking framework. Um, this is where I'm coming into conservation biology. But again, this is not really the main focus of the course. This is more of a, an introduction. Um, I will be focusing on, and I think all of us will be focusing on, in situ conservation, not ex, ex situ conservation. Um, and we'll be focusing mostly on places, which is to say we're perhaps not talking about conserving the, the fourth to last of a species, but rather the whole set of species that are at a place. And we'll be thinking about, can we use a flagship species to cover other species? But really, we're talking about places. And a, a big question then is, how do you choose those places? Um, and one, one, shall we say, complication in the history of, of conservation uh, going back to the decrees of the very first national parks, one problem has been that the way that areas get, us, get set aside for conservation is not always in accord with the goals of the conservation. So we can go back to a paper published in the 1980s, uh, Criteria Used for Protection of Natural Areas in Sweden, 1909 to 1986. There are a lot of papers like this, but this one's simple and clear. Um, and essentially what they do is they look across Swedish um, protected areas and they ask, why were they established? And what you can see is here in this graph, number of reserves, and in this graph, the area preserved. And then you can see the different criteria that were listed for the original decrees of these protected areas. The black bars are scientific cr criteria, and the white bars are uh, political criteria. And so right away, you see that, that protected areas in Sweden were decreed for a number of reasons, and not always because they were the most crucial sites to protect a particular suite of species. Now, of course, we're talking about action happening over a century, so maybe we shouldn't expect that. But also, maybe we shouldn't expect a protected areas system, like the Ethiopian National Parks or the U.S. National Parks, or whatever protected areas system, maybe we shouldn't expect those to protect biodiversity ideally and optimally because they weren't designed for that. That's not how they came into being. And even if we look through time, so here we go from 1909 to the 1980s, we don't really see the scientific criteria coming to dominate and the political criteria um, going away as far as reasons why places are set aside ostensibly for conservation. So again, this is, this is one of many studies that, that I could show you. The point is simply that we have to accept reality that sometimes the reason why a national park exists is that it's a beautiful place or that people can ski there or that people can um, 
you know, do off-road vehicles, whatever, it's not always because it's the best place for biodiversity conservation. So then the question is, well, how could you, how could you establish that ideal set of places? And again, this is with the caveat that you can have the ideal set of places, and if the implementation doesn't work, you get nowhere. But one avenue, and I would argue perhaps the best avenue towards establishing that ideal set of places to protect a complex set of entities, which are usually species, would be via analysis of what I'll call digital accessible knowledge. And these are primary biodiver biodiversity data records, so data records that put a particular species at a particular place at a particular point in time. Uh, and they have to be digital, accessible, and they have to be, I use knowledge, but let's just say integrated into the broader world of biodiversity data. So we can call this DAK, Digital Accessible Knowledge. But in my world, and again, that's not the only world, but in my world, this is uh, the currency. This is what, what we use to get to the end point of an ideal um, strategy for conservation. And digital accessible knowledge has become quite abundant. These are just some of the um, data portals that exist. And the total number of records online right now, accessible, digital, and integrated, is somewhere around 700 million records. So there is an immense amount of information available right now um, in terms of this, this primary biodiversity information. The largest such portal is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which right now is at about 639 million records. So it's an immense amount of information. Now we'll come back to how useful it is in the immediate. This is what that information looks like very crudely, just kind of how many records per uh, pixel across the surface of the Earth. And so, in, a, in an optimistic sense, we can say that digital accessible knowledge is both rich and deep. There are resources worldwide, and they can, they can reflect very importantly on conservation. Um, ideally, we would use such primary data for informing conservation decisions because they really can give us a data-driven, science-based view into where a given investment will pay off in actual protection of biodiversity. This is the optimistic view. Um, so I'm gonna give you some examples and some illustrations and some caveats. So just to give you a very simple intro, this is a study I did with a, a student of mine um, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and essentially, what we were attempting to do was to prioritize Mexican uh, lowland rainforests for conservation using uh, distributions of the birds that live in those rainforests. This is far from an up-to-date such study. I show it to you only because it's a simple example. And so what we did was we looked at the distributions of each of the species that are present in uh, these forests. Some of them have very broad distributions, some of them have very narrow distributions, and some of them have distributions that are one or two pixels on the map. And we used a, a set of algorithms for choosing places. We come to a set of, of areas in, in southeastern Mexico, um, and those areas serve to protect essentially all of the avifauna of that region. There were a few species left out. Um, one falcon, which is fairly broadly distributed uh, elsewhere in the Americas, and then the two species, oops, sorry, the two species in this genus Hylorchilus, um, each very narrowly endemic and each completely left out because these species are specialists on karst landscapes and so they kind of fall outside of the norm. Um, 
So this is a sort of the sort of idea that we could explore where we use data driven oops, did we lose power again? Okay. I, I can keep going a, a little bit while the power comes back on. That may be it coming back on. Um, we can use these data-driven approaches to pick, it basically comes down to five areas in southern Mexico that protect literally every species of bird present in those rainforests. So that was a... Okay. So that was a very simple exercise. It gave us a very clear answer. Um, the areas, the larger areas that that exercise identified were all quite clustered. And so it gave kind of a, uh, shall we say, a, a hopeful view of, of where conservation action might, might pay off rather richly. And so that's kind of one example. And in, the mom in a moment, I'll, I'll just show you a quick view of five other papers of that sort. And I hate to say it, these are very academic exercises. And again, if there's not the follow through farther downstream, they stay just as that, exercises. So that's where I, I essentially pass this off to my colleagues and hopefully we'll have a, a very rich discussion in the course of today about about how to take those next steps. Okay, so, so again, that was a very simple example. Here are five more examples that go far beyond that, and we could assemble a list of 50 or so papers of this sort that take a taxon, a region, some data, and come out with a prioritization, okay? Different regions and different taxa will be harder or easier to manage in this regard. So some of the, the caveats that we need to pay attention to, essentially I'm very careful to be honest about the limitations of, of the approaches that I, that I put up on the screen for you. Uh, we have to be very conscious of the gaps in coverage and we also have to, to be very conscious of the quality of the data that we put into these, into these uh, algorithms and analyses. Um, so I, sh I told you that, that digital accessible knowledge is rich and deep. Uh, this is just a, a log log plot of countries, just to give you an idea of the dimensions of how much information is out there. You can see the, the countries richest in biodiversity data are counting on tens to hundreds of millions of records. And then, and I'm, I apologize, I didn't identify Ethiopia on this, on this graph, but you can see that there's quite a bit of scatter. And this is also di divided into records from the country versus records provided by other countries. And so a country that depends on data from outside is down in this sector and a country that's rather self-sufficient in terms of biodiversity information is above the line. So I'm, I'm moving rather quickly because I want to obey my own request to stay on time. Um, but if we look at inventory completeness, and I'm not going to go into the details, this is for the birds of the world as of end of 2014, 237 million records. What I want you to see is that the red areas are presenting rather complete inventories of the birds of these, these um, half degree pixels. But then the blue areas are these massive gaps. So we, we immediately see a problem. If we look here in Ethiopia, we have half a dozen pixels that are well, that are well inventoried and then the rest of the country not. Now maybe the data exists, but in some sense they didn't get into this pool of digital accessible and integrated, so DAK. Let's just look at Peru quickly. Um, here is a, 
kind of a raw view of 700,000 records of birds from Peru. But if I look at those data carefully, I notice some really silly errors, like this point in Bolivia and this point in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. If I come in more closely, well, with birds we have marine species, so I'm, I'm okay with some offshore records here. But this is not offshore, and those are also errors. And then I've colored each record by the state that it apparently falls in. And so wherever you see multiple colors of uh, pixels in a particular state, look here where we have mainly purple dots and then a green one and a, and a purple one, those are errors. And we don't we're not necessarily able to pick out why they are errors, but we have an inconsistency somewhere in our data. And so if I look across all Peruvian bird records, this much, about three quarters, is usable. And this much has some sort of problem. And so looks pretty optimistic, doesn't it? But if I eliminate observational records, which are essentially constrained to include a timestamp and include a proper taxonomic name, then I get a very different view, where it's about 20% of the records are usable. And most of, the, most of the records get lost. So again, one problem is the gaps in our coverage and what I call data leakage, where you may have a lot of water coming into the, the, uh, you know, the main feed of water into your house, but if you have leaks in your plumbing system, you still get no water out of your faucet. So those are, those are some, some kind of honest accounting of, of problems with these data that we work with. So what can we do uh, as far as ways forward? Well, certainly one approach is to document based on what we do know well. And so I've been involved recently in taking digital accessible knowledge records for Mexican birds. But instead of trying to look across the whole country, instead distilling down to the very small set of sites that we definitely know well. Okay, and so we did that um, for five kilometer resolution and then slightly larger resolution, coarser resolution. And essentially we have a network of sites across the country that we can use as, shall we say, detectors of change. Um, this is another effort along the same lines where with a bunch of colleagues from Mexico, we looked at the same data but in a much more coarse sense. These are one degree squares. And we compared historical data from before 2000 with recent data from after 2000 and we asked where have the avifaunas changed? I won't go into the details but we went to a lot of effort to assure that the historical and recent inventories were both complete and those data were complete enough everywhere where you see a red square. Now notice that this is a very coarse spatial resolution. But if we look at, and this is just looking at endemic species in Mexico, just of birds. If we look at gains of species, we really have very little of interest happening across the country. Um, but if we look at losses of species, we see quite a bit of loss of species kind of in the northern half of the country. And we can turn that into an overall measure of turnover. And we see this. But perhaps the most interesting thing was we took the possible drivers of this turnover. We looked at precipitation change changing over the same period of middle 20th century to early 21st century. No significant effect. Human impact on landscapes at this coarse resolution, I emphasize that. Human impact on landscapes, same thing, no significant effects. 
again, at that coarse resolution. But observed temperature change across the board had strong, significant effects. So a very damning uh, climate change signature as far as what's driving changes in distributions of Mexican bird faunas. Um, but those are coarse. And so going back to this result, now what we're doing is we're resurveying these sites. Very, very quickly, I'll show you two of these sites that have been done so far. Uh, Misantla and Veracruz on the coast of Mexico and the Valley of Mexico where Mexico City is. Um, we've worked with, shall we say, very diverse sources. This is a, a, a manuscript from the 1700s that provided very, very uh, thorough documentation, more than 200 species of Mexican birds. Um, this is, for example, uh, one of our blackbirds, not your blackbirds, they're different families. Um, but one of our blackbirds that was endemic to the Valley of Mexico and went extinct. Um, we've also used literature sources that go back about a hundred years. Uh, and we see non-native species actually more populous in the 1800s than in the 2000s. And we see aquatic species in red reducing somewhat. Now the reason I'm going to go a little faster than planned. The reason is that the aquatic species used to see the Valley of Mexico as paradise, this wonderful system of lakes. And even into the 20th century, here's Mexico City. This is viewed from one of the mountains surrounding Mexico City. And you can see large agricultural areas that were at least seasonally flooded. But that's what that same view looks like now. So 1890s and two years ago. And a different view of the same region, 1905 and two years ago. So landscape change that's nothing short of catastrophic. But the real reason for the change is this. Around 1900, a canal was cut that changed the drainage patterns of those lakes. And so instead of draining to the Pacific Ocean, the Valley of Mexico now drains to the Atlantic Ocean, comes out at this, you can see the water quality is horrifying, um, but comes out at this site on the East Coast. And this essentially removed those lake systems entirely. So that's why we see the decline in aquatic species. The other end of the spectrum is this site in Veracruz, uh, surveyed by an undergraduate student in, in the National University of Mexico. Um, you can see the accumulation of species with effort. There's the, the it's, a, it's a small town, it's called Misantla, between 2001 and 2012, not a lot of change. Um, but in the 1850s, we can see it was already quite changed. The interesting thing was comparing the historical inventories, early 1900s, with the present, what we see is no change. Well, the reason is this. For Misantla, the disturbance happened 300, 400 years ago, as the Europeans colonized um, Mexico. So the Europeans arrive, the disturbance happens, but our before surveys, in a before and after view, our before surveys came after the disturbance, so we see no, different, no change. For the Valley of Mexico, the big agent of disturbance happened after or during our surveys. So these are just some, some ways of, of improving on the basic products that we can get from uh, data-driven analyses of digital accessible knowledge. Now, I've given you mostly Mexican examples, and that's because I've worked there um, as a researcher off and on for several decades now. Mexico is also a very interesting example um, 
in terms of, of a country taking maximum advantage of these data. So several decades worth of work were put into accumulating, digitizing, and enabling Mexican biodiversity data. Um, and now those are translating into products like this. So this is a, um, a set of books written by Mexican uh, biologists um, commissioned by a government agency such that they have every ch possibility of translating into conservation action. But it's called the Natural Capital of Mexico. And essentially what they've done is assemble huge amounts of distributional information and turn that into, these are our sites that would need to be protected to assure zero extinction, okay? Now obviously, that's not gonna happen. Not all of that is going to happen, but some of it can happen. And perhaps they can be prioritized by which of that should happen. So my apologies for moving so, so quickly, but essentially I wanted to give you an overview of the precursor steps. The rest of today, we'll be talking much more about conservation action and implementation. This talk is about kind of what, what might feed into positioning that action or strategizing that action. So I would argue that digital accessible knowledge is at least the appropriate basis, but the digital accessible knowledge needs to be used very carefully. This is not a, um, an unblazed trail. This is not something that hasn't been done before. Um, and a good example is Mexico, which has invested very significantly in enabling its biodiversity data, essentially making its biodiversity data uh, available to this sort of analysis. And as a result, um, not only can we track changes in Mexican biodiversity very clearly, but also we can develop very forward-thinking plans for how to protect that biodiversity. So again, I'll just leave you with the message that perhaps an important challenge is how to replicate that sort of success elsewhere in the world. So with that, I hope I'm not over time, good. Um, but with that, I will stop. <laughs>